uh, since this site was found. Uh, and it, it really is an extraordinary site. And when I first got hired here, this was the main thing I was doing for almost five years. So let's see if I can get this. Okay, page up. Page down, does that work? Oh, page down is how you go forward. All right, you know, you've all seen this more <laughs> times than you can stand, I'm sure. You know, we have the best dinosaur record anywhere uh, in the United States, clearly, and almost the best record anywhere in the world. England's actually fairly com uh, competitive with us. Uh, uh, but otherwise, you know, Utah really stands alone. And I want to, okay. Oops. That's interesting. Do I get to move that? I just put some... Oh, that's different. The pointer mm -hmm. is, <laughs> hmm, okay, folks, here's the pointer. Okay. <laughs> down, 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 down. And then over, 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 over. <laughs> and this is what we're talking about, sure, actually. We can go down to the boundary between the Chinle and the Moanabe. But we're talking at the Triassic-Jurassic boundary uh, interval. And this track site is pretty much in the very beginning of the Jurassic, uh, probably within the first million years of the Jurassic, following the mass extinction at the end of the Triassic. So it's in a real important time interval for understanding the history of dinosaurs. In fact, if you've seen talks by Randy Ermis and, and others working in the Triassic, they, they go out of their way to really get across to you there aren't many dinosaurs in the Triassic. There are rare elements in the Triassic. And really, when you hit the base of the Jurassic, that's when the age of dinosaurs begins in North America. Now, in 2000, Sheldon Johnson discovered dinosaur tracks uh, over off of River Road uh, in a, saw, a farm that he bought, basically so he could teach his kids how to do an honest day's work. <coughs> Sheldon is an optometrist in St. George. He served on the school board for 19 years. And when he found this site, of course, uh, you know, his son is a geology prof at Dixie College, uh, his stepson. And Kelly, you know, had warned him, though Kelly kind of denies this. Sheldon told me the story multiple times. So I'll go with Sheldon. So. <laughs> He's the, the king of this site. But Sheldon basically said, you know, Kelly told me to look for tracks. He just didn't tell me to look under the rocks. <laughs> so he was looking for tracks on top of the rocks. And if you look, I'm not going to use the pointer anymore because that works terribly. Well, I'm just on the other side of the pointer from me, you see a beautiful track. Oh, yeah. You can mm -hmm. see the pads. You can see the claws of a reasonable-sized meat-eating dinosaur. And that was like the first flock he found. Yeah, this is one of the discovery blocks. This thing that, you know, in my mind, it should be like Plymouth Rock, and they should do a laser scan of the whole thing and sell it, sell it as a souvenir in small mm. scale uh, at the site. And hopefully someday they'll do that. But when you look at that rock, you see mud cracks, you see that beautiful track. If you look at the tr track, the underside, those claws are flat. But what you're looking at is the surface that's worn as those things walk across the ground. So you're really seeing what's impacting. And when he found the first really good one like that, his thought was there was actually a dinosaur foot sticking out of the rock. Uh, you know, since Sheldon hadn't been around any uh, paleo sites like this before. Uh, now, about nine months before this happened, uh, I had just started my job. I was here probably a month or so. And Jeff Eaton, he used to be at Weber State and is now uh, retired down in Tropic. Uh, I was going down looking at the Cretaceous because I had done a lot of work in the Cretaceous over the years and a lot of work in Cedar Canyon. So we met up in Cedar Canyon to look at some of his uh, dinosaur sites, for him mostly mammal sites, that's what his interest is in. And he introduced me to this guy right here, uh, Andrew Milner. <laughs> And I didn't have a clue that this was going to be such a really historic meeting for Southern Utah. Uh, 
Andrew took us into this little side canyon uh, to show us some place where he found some fish jaws. And while we we're looking for fish jaws, we found a whole pile of stomatopods, which are mantis shrimps. And if any of you have seen specials where they really talk about mantis shrimps, you know, they're the way they flip their arm is one of the fastest animal motions uh, on earth. And these things, you know, crack open shells with these uh, special claws uh, that have been turned into hammers. Uh, and it's quite, they're quite remarkable. This site was full of them. I mean, complete. They weren't big ones, so, you know, up to two inches long. And the rocks were loaded with them. Uh, Andrew had sent some of these off to a specialist in crustaceans. And unfortunately, uh, uh, they did some work on them, but when they sent them back, they didn't pack them right and they were all destroyed. Oh. Uh, but the site, you know, sometime we need to go back in there and collect more, you know, because there, there are lots of them. And we probably can get better than what we collected in this one day that we were in there. Uh, but this was pretty exciting. And, you know, he gave me a call, said, Jim, you got to come down. They got this track site in St. George at a construction site. It's really pretty remarkable. You know, this was my first, I guess it was probably my first trip out of town that I had as a state paleontologist. So I've been on, I'm going to get a state vehicle and go down there. And <coughs> basically, the assistant director, Kim Hardy, said, okay, you know, see if you can get some big blocks of dinosaur tracks you can bring back to put in our rock gardens around the building. You know, since, you know, this is a construction site, you know, they're going to destroy the site, obviously, if it's a construction site. Uh, so see if we can save some and have some nice pretties to put around the building here. So I headed down there, trying to, you know, okay, I'm gonna find us some cute fossils to bring back here. Well, when I got there, I quickly realized that the Johnsons had it well in hand. Uh, basically, uh, Sheldon Laverna, uh, when Sheldon first found this site, you know, uh, you know, he showed me around, took me down the river, they had taken all kinds of blocks down and dumped them in along the side of the Virgin River for erosion control. You can see, like, if the right side was facing up, there's tracks. You know, I said, yeah, they those blocks, you don't see the tracks on, they're on the downside. So uh, he spent uh, a couple months after my first trip down there fishing those things out of, the, out of the side of the Virgin River and bringing them back up uh, uh, to his main property. Uh, but I really, you know, it was... Uh, pretty exciting because you know I came back here and you know well what you know what are we gonna do should we send a flatbed truck down what are you gonna you know what are we gonna get and then we're not gonna get anything because the Johnsons their only interest is what can we do with this you know credible treasure that we've been gifted with that's gonna benefit our community you know this is you know basically a great American success story. This whole site. The next, the rest of this talk is success, 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 one after another. If everything worked this well, uh, it would be a, a wonderful place. <laughs> Let me tell you. But if you look at that track, and I got labeled as intriguing track. You look at that thing, and the toes look blunter uh, than the one down below. Uh, you see the tracks there; they're, they're longer toed. Uh, so I'm looking at that and I'm thinking, oh, that looks like an ornithopod, a plant-eating dinosaur track. Doesn't have the big long claws on it. You know, this is pretty exciting because these would be the oldest big ornithopod tracks ever found. So I called on Martin Lockley to come down there and we went down. Uh, the guy in the blue hat's Rob Gaston. The guy in the pink hat is Martin Lockley. And Sheldon, you know, as everyone tells me down there, they were all like tying Sheldon up to keep him from just flipping over more rocks, <laughs> over tracks, you know. We want to map these. We want to record what's going on with this site. So we mapped the surface. There was a real nice line of joints. If you look at the, uh, the map here, you can see there's rectangular things. Those are the blocks. And you can just see the cracks, you know. Get the track hoe, put it in the cracks, pop them up. You know, those are the size of the blocks. So knowing that, we could really map the site uh, pretty well as we were flipping the tracks over. And as we were working, you know, Andrew and I were looking, you know, closely at some rippled areas and we realized there are tracks on top of the, uh, the main layer as well. So it's like, do we want to flip them all? Do, or do we want to look at some of this and do some work on this surface as well? 
So we took one end, flipped the tracks up, mapped them, and then we just basically uncovered more of the surface on the main track level and mapped those tracks as well. So we had two layers at that time that are producing tracks. And if you look behind the track hoe there, you can see the Pine Valley Mountains. You know, my whole career has been telling these guys, focus on interpreting what's in line of sight of your facility, because you've got a lot of stuff you can interpret in line of sight. Because that basically goes all the way from the base of the Jurassic, Triassic, really where I'm standing, or already beyond the Triassic, all the way up into the tertiary with the uh, lack of list of the Pine Valley Mountains ringed by Cretaceous strata that also has terrestrial vertebrates within it. So pretty, pretty exciting stuff. And, uh, you know, go across the street, look at the road cut, and you can see, you know, the main track surface. You know, these are dinosaur tracks sticking out of the bottom of, of these layers in cross section. Uh, just as nice as can be. Uh, and basically what's going on here is these are natural tracks, uh, casts of the track where the animal's walking along on this firm clay surface that had mud cracks in it, if you remember the preserved mud cracks. Uh, and the mud cracks are going to the clay, the dinosaurs are pinching into this, you know, real dense clay, real uh, well compacted, uh, leaving us these uh, real nice impressions then there's a flooding event on the shore of what we'll now we'll start calling Lake Dixie, and the sand came in above it, filling this irregular surface. And filling this surface resulted in beautiful preservation of, of these tracks and mud cracks and other things uh, along that surface. Uh, natural tracks, of course, the true tracks on the upper surface, as you'd see there, and they can squeeze down so you get an under track that's not as well defined, you know, from below the main surface the animal walked on. So there's a number of different conditions, and they basically give you different bits of information. Uh, and you don't want to compare true tracks against just poorly preserved uh, under tracks that have been filled, because the morphology looks real different. And this is what happened with those ornithopod tracks. You know, as we were digging over there, pulling the blocks back, we pulled one, and popping off the bottom of it was one of these ornithopod tracks, these short-toed, wide-foot tracks. And we looked at it, and between the three toes, there were these sharp claw marks between both of the toes. And I'm like, what's going on with this thing? And we realized that the track was about that deep. It was really deep into the clay. And we realized when these animals, this meat-eater, would step into the clay and go way down in it, the middle metatarsal, remember they're three-toed, would sink the furthest, and the toes would flex back, and claws would flex back. So you weren't seeing the full claw marks, you're just seeing the bases of the claws impinged on that clay. And then when it pulls its foot out, it pulls its toes together, and we were catching the claws, you know, clipping the side of the track as it pulled it out of the hole. So we got the whole track going in and the track foot coming out of those deep tracks. So it's just another expression in addition to a you know, really clean uh, under track. You know, you gotta, be, you gotta be careful. You really have to keep this in your mind, you know, what you're seeing. Now, Eubrontes is the track name for these large three-toed theropod tracks. And here's one that slipped a bit. You can see the flat you know, undersurface of the worn claw, but see how these things stretch? There's the end of the toe. You know, this thing slipped in the mud and pulled his foot back. Here are the metatarsals, this part. So it put his foot in, you know, whoa, you know, you see this thing skating on the mud uh, <laughs> there for that one. We call that the devil's hand. Uh, then we have this nice trackway there, three tracks in sequence. Once again, see this nice smooth surface of the worn underside of those claws as they're being worn on the ground walking. There's another type of track we get there that's been named Gigantopus. And Gigantopus has a very thickened middle toe uh, and a very distinct dew claw uh, that you see coming off the side there. And you bronchies, you really don't see the dew claw on these things. You know, it's actually, it actually seems to be farther up on the wrist 
uh, than it is in Gigantopus. So there seems to be two kinds of animals, but because of the vagaries of preservation, people are real leery <laughs> trying to declare. There are two kinds of big theropod here, about the same size, uh, with two different types of tracks. <coughs> we see scratch marks on the sides of the feet, and the, and the, the what they call uh, scale impressions, but it's like you look at your own dog, you know, the little papillae at the bottom of their feet. That's basically what these are, the papillae. They're not true scales, but they're the structures form basically callus on the bottom of the feet. And it's that structure you see impressed there, and they form the scratch marks you see as the foot goes through the clay uh, into the ground. Uh, one of the things we found was that uh, about five inches above that bottom surface, you know, this thing is backwards, remember? We were looking at the bottom <coughs> and, and reading it upside down. So there's the mud crack surface as a nice, clean, big tracks. You know, these mud cracks, you see they're rounded, rounded off. That's because there's probably other sediment that got in the cracks before the sand, main sand, got in that rounded that off. But you see that fracture? Call this the five inch layer. You see it's washed off. You can see there's evidence of current direction there. And we have smaller tracks on that surface, a thing that's been referred to as growl ladder. And you can see them here. You can see them over here. You can see scratch marks from twigs and things being pulled across that surface. You know, you have this whole dynamic of things going on. Uh, and this is between the layers. So this whole bed has got a history in its own right. In fact, when we look at the main track layer, there's a nice big Ubrontes track there. Here's another one here, track, and it's been cut off by this thing that's sticking down below that level. It cuts through it, taking out part of that track. Uh, this surface here has a ground ladder track on it, and it's been cut down. This is an, a scour in the surface that after, you know, the, the animals in the mud cracks formed during the flood event, maybe the same flood event that eventually led to the sand coming in, you know, before, maybe before the sand really got there, scoured down, eroded clay away, and cut down into the clay bed. And that clay, deeper down, was softer. So because of that, we have smaller animals impressing into these tracks. One of the things that Andrews discovered, and this, this was, you know, Andrews made a lot of really important observations on this site, is that ground ladder tracks, the only time you ever see them on this surface is on Eubronis tracks, where the Eubronis has sunk through that, you know, firm crust of mud cracks deeper into the softer clay so that a Eubronis walking over the surface can make a track. So the only time you'll see a Eubronis track on that surface is in, a, I mean, a growl ladder track is in a Eubronis footprint. Uh, and it's the same with these scours. And all these little marks here are salt crystals, <laughs> little triclinic salt crystals, maybe gypsum, maybe uh, a borate that you see in uh, the Death Valley uh, plias. Uh, we don't know because it's filled with sand. We're seeing sand-filled salt casts. <clears throat> Uh, the top surface said a lot of tracks, got some unusual things. We have some really tiny tracks. Uh, we have some other tacks that we'll talk about a little bit more here in a bit. This is something I covered that I covered actually both of these working with Andrew and Don. But when I first uncovered this, the first thing I thought was I found a stingray. <laughs> you know, it's like, what is this? But I think it's some sort of plant. But, you know, you see this central stem that comes out, and we see pieces of stuff like this just loose on the surface. Goes into the middle of it, there are folds radiating out from it, but you don't see any veination. You know, you're seeing a typical leaf. So, you know, even Sid Ash, the big paleobotanist that we brought in on this project, Sid's like, I don't think that's a plant. And I said, well, what do you think it is? <laughs> it's, a, it's a garbage bag that got loose from someone and washed in there in the, tri in the beginning of the Jurassic. Now, what I think it might be, it may be some you know, water plant that maybe its, it's relationships are with liverworts 
or you know some other type of thing that today wouldn't be so big as as we see in this habitat. But still, that's the only one we got. It was on the soft top surface. We see it's in clays. So we fortunately made a cast of it because the thing eventually was obliterated by weather. This is outside, remember? And there's not a lot we could do about it, but we did make a cast of it. This is kind of pre-photogrammetry. Found a track of an animal that slipped. And yeah, claws there, claws there. <laughs> Went there. And one of the things really neat, you get this trackway going up there. And when we look at it, we realize there's tail drags. And you see as it walked, the tail would drag on this side, next step would drag on the other side. You know, just kind of hitting down. It wasn't like pulling it along the whole way. So it's kind of flopping onto the ground periodically. So we have this trackway going across that surface of a Ubrontes with a beautiful tail drag associated. Here's Don putting glue. Here's growl ladder tracks. There's growl ladder tracks all over that surface. But we think that's an early turtle trackway or something going through there. That's another really interesting piece that wasn't, didn't survive. Uh, you know, and, and unfortunate because of the nature of uh, as fast as this went. Well, lots of tourists started coming. First thing Sheldon did was put a fence up around the place. This was you know, his personal property. So he put a fence up because basically people were showing up and trying to grab blocks and take them. In fact, they caught people trying to get them over the fence. These big blocks are, you know, foot and a half thick. You know, trying to get these things over fences. You know, free tracks. This is private property. <laughs> you know, it's like going to someone's backyard, taking whoever's there. Hey, it's in their backyard. They don't want it anymore. You know, so he put a fence around the place. Because there are so many tourists, there's busloads of kids who start to come in from Vegas and whatnot to see this place. He put this shelter up. He paid for this all out of his own pocket. You know, put up the shelter. Uh, so there's a large area over the blocks, not over the track site where we were doing a lot of active work, but over the blocks so people could have basically set up a tour of the place. But that's all out of his, you know, wonderful heart. Uh, volunteers started accumulating at the site really quickly. And it started with people in the neighborhood, you know, looking down the street. What's going on down there? In fact, Teresa Walker, this woman right here, she lives just up the street and was a classic person looking up the street, what's going on up there? Coming up to see what's going on, saying they need help. And she just volunteered to be a, you know, a volunteer coordinator just to figure out who can be there when and, and lining up so there's always people to lead tours. And these are a bunch of the early volunteers there. You'll recognize Tyler. Yeah, you know, that's where I first met Tyler. He was an undergrad student in Vegas. And he started coming up because he liked dinosaurs and volunteer, volunteering on the site. These guys actually aren't volunteers or slaves. Uh, <laughs> uh, Burgess, uh, Sons, Burgess and Troy, I mean, uh, Andrew Sons. Uh, Burgess is named for the Burgess Shale. Uh, Troy is named for Troy, Troy Less, which is a lake up in sub-Arctic Canada that his wife owns a fishing camp at, or her family does. And then we'll see her again, Dr. Sarah Gibson. Sarah started there as an undergraduate. She was going to Southern Utah University and started coming down there to volunteer and got started getting pretty serious about the whole thing. And of course, you know, you need uh, some friends to put the project over the top. A lot of politicians started coming down because there was a lot of media attention to this thing. <laughs> You know, Governor Mike Levitt came down pretty early on to give Sheldon an award for good citizenship. Jim Matheson, of course, he was the con congressman for that area, came out multiple times. Senator Bill Bennett came out. Orrin Hatch, this is where we are at the opening of the museum uh, there. I wasn't prepared to be meeting with uh, Orrin Hatch. I just showed up to say, great job, guys. Uh, but the guy I want to point out is State Senator John Bill Hickman, because he's the first one that got us money. <laughs> and the first thing he did was put $100,000 extra into the Utah Geologic Survey budget so that we could work with the city down there to preserve the site. Unfortunately, they just put the money in the budget without saying anything. So, you know, the survey is like, 
Hey, free money. We got an extra hundred grand. We can do whatever we want with. Hey, this is great. We'll just, you know, we'll have a big party. <laughs> and I had to work really hard to get them to split the money between us and the city of St. George. Uh, the money that went to the city of St. George, they used to hire Andrew Milner. Uh, and, uh, you know, if it hadn't been for that, Andrew wouldn't be running the show now. And uh, that, that was a huge step forward. And it allowed Don and I to justify going down there on a regular basis and working on the site and helping oversee. But Andrew was there day in, day out. You know, he wasn't being paid full time. He was only paid part time. But he was there more than full time the whole time. Then later, he came up with more money that he gave to Dixie College for a paleontology position in the geology program there. But he figured Dixie College would overlap with the, the track site. So they, they basically announced that this will be a position for the director of paleontology at Dixie College, figuring that Dixie College would run the track site. They haven't, and they still don't. <laughs> run by a nonprofit board, but Jerry still has half of his time devoted to the track site. Uh, other things, of course, great ripple marks, you know, crayfish impressions. If you look at the bed, the main track bed and cross section, you can see in places climbing ripple cross beds. Here's one of the parting surfaces with interference ripples on it. So you see, here's that five inch layer. The red are tracks. And here's the ripple layer right there. Here's another layer with tracks. And then the top, there are the, the thin top layers that we see all the tracks in all over the place. And associated with that and under it as well, we've got these weird agates, these red agates, often hollow. And when you look at this, all of a sudden you realize this is a pile of driftwood that was drifted up onto this thing, which I now interpret as a sandbar on the side of uh, Lake Dixie. Uh, that formed sand accumulating, coming out in a river, wave action would bring the sand down along the coast, and it would pile up layer upon layer after storm events. Later, there's more storm events. They caused er erosion, so we end up with these erosional mega ripples. And you can see Monty there standing, and you see the scale of these large mega ripples. And these are erosional. They're cutting down through these beds. But the sand being reworked tends to be on the lee side and on top. These are the thin beds that preserve, you know, fine symmetrical wave ripples, the little tracks, uh, and a variety of other things. So it's quite the, quite the story. Now, you know, where do we get the names for the tracks? You know, people always say Dilophosaurus made this, these tracks. It's the only animal we know of in the early Jurassic and North America that's the right size. And as I said, with Gigantopus, there may be two kinds of animal there. You go to the Cayenta, there's also a thing called Cayentopus uh, that's got a distinctly different track. So there's a variety of different animals that are about 20 foot long that are probably making some pretty good sized tracks. You know, it's not Dilophosaurus. It occurred about 10 million years later. But something in that size range. Okay, growl adder. You know, we have, in the early Jurassic, a thing that's now uh, was named Centaurus, but now is known as Megatnosaurus, which means big dead lizard. You know, a beetle worker figured out that Centaurus was used by a beetle name. You can only use a name once. So the uh, beetle guy said, how'd get him? And re changed the name to big dead lizard uh, <laughs> for those animals. Uh, the paleontology community is really trying to get away from that and started calling these uh, Coelophysis as well, but they're not. They're just really a different animal. The foot structure is different and whatnot. But if you compare a Coelophysis feet with a Gatnosaurus feet, you know, I mean, which one produces that track? Probably both of them <laughs> produce a track that, because of the vagaries and how tracks are preserved, you wouldn't be able to tell apart. So we have a different name, what we call Ichnotaxa. Uh, ICNO relating to traces. Uh, so these ICNO taxa have their own name uh, as opposed to the name trying to call it, oh, this is a Coelophysis track. We can't say that. This are little crocodilian tracks. Uh, there's Bat Track Opus, little skeleton at Harvard. 
uh, some of the tracks, a bat track opus. See these nice little claws, and this might even be a bat track opus swim track uh, there. Uh, Tritalon, mammal like reptiles or synapsids. Tritalodonts are an important part of lower Jurassic communities in the southwestern US. There's real big ones like Cayentotherium. That skull, I've got a cast of one upstairs that's about that long. Then there are tiny ones that have skulls that are less than an inch long. Uh, their tracks, though, look like little mammal tracks. Uh, Navahopus is uh, probably from something like Cayentotherium. Brazil ichneum, which you see in the Wingate and around this site here, uh, is a much smaller animal. But if you look at this carefully, you can see this track actually has skin impressions uh, on the bottom of it. Uh, invertebrate traces. These surfaces have a variety. Uh, you know, this, uh, I'm not sure what it is, it actually has a trace. This is a uh, horseshoe crab trace. Uh, these are probably traces formed by uh, clams moving along the bottom, you know, just kind of, you know, walking along the substrate. That's probably a crayfish, Dragonus telson. That's probably some sort of worm or, or centipede track. Or, so it's probably subaqueous. These are settling, these may be settling traces from tadpoles into the surface. Uh, and then this is a variety of things that are probably plant related. But you can see this is a real healthy environment. There's a lot going on here, and we haven't seen a body fossil yet. Uh, well, one day I came down there, look across the street, and there's all those track hoes over there just digging like crazy. I'm like, what are they doing? They're digging right into the track layers. And then, oh, that's a developer across the street, Darcy Stewart from, uh, uh, what is it, Snow Can, one of the big uh, developments out there by Snow Canyon, uh, you know, digging through, they're finding track blocks. I got, you know, if anyone has phone number, where's his office? I got to talk to this guy. So I got a hold of Darcy and I got it so he would let Andrew go over and record data on these tracks across the street. And, our, you know, Andrew would go over, map the, the blocks, record it, and he, he was real good. Darcy was a good guy about this. But then one day, uh, Andrew comes down and all the workers are standing on this side here. There's the road, you know, they're right by the road here. And they're all standing there and they all have their brooms out and they're sweeping the surface and they're, we got more tracks here. You know, none of the track hoes are operating. They're all down cleaning the track surface off. So uh, basically they're cleaning this thing off and we're seeing these big depressions, uh, like one here and uh, there's actually one, everybody's standing around there. Darcy's in front of one here, big round depression. And at first we're going, these sauropod tracks? You know, what are these things? You know, cutting down through the mud crack surface into this level. And this is above the track level. Uh, you know, track level there is almost a road, the height of the road. This is another level a bit higher in the, the section. Uh, it's pretty exciting there, you know, finding all kinds of stuff. And Darcy comes over and looks at this stuff, and he'd been taking semi-truck loads of blocks out to Hilldale and storing them out there, figuring he'd sell them at some point and do something with them. And he's sitting there looking at this, finally goes, we, we, this has got to be saved. And so in 30 days from my first talk to Darcy, he went from selling tracks or thinking about selling tracks to being one of the biggest donors to the project. <laughs> And Darcy, at that point, just jumped in both feet, put his engineers on the job, put uh, all his people on there, and donated the land across the road. So Sheldon donated the tracks and the land on one side of the road, Darcy did the same to the other side. So this site has major stuff on both sides of the road uh, that have been donated uh, to the site. In fact, Darcy, I was with Andrew one time, and, and we, uh, Darcy comes driving up, Said, how you guys doing? Anything new? And, you know, Andrew's like, I gotta, you know, get some money, get some more glue. And he just gives him a hundred dollar bill. Get all the glue you need, <laughs> whatever you need. <laughs> you know, just uh, <laughs> totally jumped in. Yeah. Uh, but all that excavation work across the road allowed me to collect some geologic information, which I like. So I plotted up the stratigraphic column for the entire section there. Uh, spent a few days really pulling it together. Uh, 
You know, here's the Chin Li, see the pink, and the Triassic. There's this conglomeratic unit that forms the base there. Uh, the TR5JO unconformity. This mudstone interval with some sands in it for the lower dinosaur canyon. Then you go into these big ledgy beds for the upper dinosaur canyon, which is more like where it is like at Dinosaur Canyon. Here's the Whitmore Point, these nice purple lake beds in it, as you see in front of those homes. And then above that, the Springdale Sandstone. And as we did this, we plotted where our tracks occurred and where fossil fish occurred, where microfossils occurred, where plants occurred, uh, trace fossils of various kinds, mud crack surfaces, and we plotted up all the environmental data as well as the lithologic characteristics. This is the main track surface right here. And, uh, you know, when we put this all together, we realized, you know, this is remarkable. At the time we, we first did the section, we had 17 track surfaces through that section there, which was pretty impressive. But then, you know, for me, because I like fish, look at all the fish levels that occur there as well. And those are bones. Uh, across the road, Andrew was looking around where they'd been doing some digging and found some blocks on the surface, brought them back, figured out how they went together, looking at them, realized these are swim tracks. There's the middle toe of a grand ladder, the two side toes, middle side toes, middle side toes. These are swim tracks. Basically, the animal is floating it up in the water, and, but its feet are still impinging on the sediment floor uh, beneath. Uh, and this is the first recognition of swim tracks anywhere in North America at the time. Uh, more of them, and as Andrew found across the street, uh, there are literally bunches of blocks. All these boxes are made, they're still sitting out to the side of the, the museum, all have swim tracks under them. He's mapped all the blocks, we can put them back together. Uh, incredible. Here's a swim track, and you can actually see with the, how the claw went in and then pulled out excavating and cleaning the mud off of these surfaces. We actually found like toes where the animal's foot went in to the mud and after it pulled it out, the mud slumped in and closed it off so it got sand in the toe, but then it pinches off so you have like an isolated toe of a dinosaur in the mud. So, oh, fossil toe, great, look, it's got a nice claw on it. <laughs> but uh, Andrew's writing some of this stuff up because Swim tracks have skin impressions, and they're really exciting a lot about biomechanically, what are these things doing uh, relative to the substrate? These are real activities. Now, you know, at the time when they're really excavating this, they're putting up the Fossil Ridge Middle School. They've got a nice bass relief of uh, Dilophosaurus in their auditorium. Uh, but here's the main track site over here. It's big, thick, the sandbar. Thins out as you go across the road, uh, long to near the school, and then all of a sudden it thickens again. And the swim tracks are all in that thick area. And when you map it, what happens is, uh, you know, here's where they're, they're, they're mat you know, collected the swim tracks. All that stuff has been collected. And you look at, here's the current direction, but the swim tracks go the opposite way. You know, so they're, you know, what's happening is the longshore currents that bring the sand in going along the coast during storms were scoured off a, a deep spot offshore uh, along it. And these animals wandering around in the water, you know, if you're a little growl at her, you know, you're that tall, you're like a velociraptor, you're pretty small. You walk along and all of a sudden you step off the edge and from walking in knee deep water, all of a sudden the water's in there and you're floating and the current's taking you, you know, rip torrent and you start kicking. And, you know, so I, I call these floundering marks as opposed to swim tracks, <laughs> you know, but they distinctly show the vast majority of these animals were going the opposite direction. But Andrew found a Ubrani set of swim tracks in there and it's clear this guy was just lounging its way across and not even caring about the, the current going in the opposite direction. And, you know, we've given whole talks on this. I mean, this is pretty serious science. In the lake, microfossils, you know, we have coccostracans, clam shrimps with a keratinaceous shell, get to about a half an inch across, and ostracods, which are much smaller, crustaceans with a calcitic shell, you can do a lot of nice geochem things with them. And here we are collecting microfossils, 
You know, he used very delicate techniques to get <laughs> these things out of the ground. But here's a picture of a Triassic thing with freshwater clams and conchostracans and stuff and ostracized swimming around the water. You still find these things in potholes up in the Navajo, you know, around Canyonlands. Still today, different taxa, but the same sorts of things. They like puddles. Fish eat them. <laughs> but that big surface of the lake beds, you know, you can see it stretches for this whole distance to where this housing development is working there, you know, along just about on bedding planes. And we walk, we realize there are all these nodules with fish material in them. And we were finding fish and all kinds of stuff. So I called Karen Chin because we found these long, round, you know, nodules. And I thought, oh, maybe these are coprolites, a, a fish eater, you know, and, you know, and it's pooping out fish debris. So I brought in Karen, the dinosaur poop lady from the University of Colorado. And we went out, uh, had a big volunteer group uh, uh, from here and mapped it. See, here's one of the, what we call fish sticks uh, in here. And it covered some big areas. In fact, we set up a trailer out there. We're quite there for quite a while. Oops. Okay. Look at this layer here. You can see the fish sticks. What, what do you see in, about this pattern of all these lines? They're, they're not random. They're not random in direction or even spacing. They're parallel. So what's going on with these things? Mm -hmm. Then another layer, you know, just above the fish sticks, we have splats, which tend to include where you find more complete fish. Uh, but we get fish in these, but they're rolled up in them. They're, they're wrapped around these things. And when you look at the fish sticks, these cylindrical things versus the splats, uh, we, we interpret this as representing an environment where there are storm waves coming in. And we have algae on the lake floor. Remember, shallow water. Uh, the shallow lake floor, you have all this algal scum. This is based on La Jolla, uh, Spain, the, the lake beds there. And basically, I think it was very similar here. We just had mats of algae, which you get little oxygen bubbles forming in the algae. And then during a big storm, basically, there's kind of a neutral buoyancy. So dead fish, even fish with ganoid scales, these diamond-shaped enameloid scales, those scales would just kind of float on this stuff. And as it was washing back and forth, the algae was ripped off the seafloor and was rolled into these sticks, these fish sticks, with the fishes that had been dead in the algae as well. Uh, and this is a unique, one-of-a-kind, a, a taponomic occurrence. No one has ever found fossils with this kind of a setting anywhere in the world before this documentation. This paper came out about two months ago. Uh, you know, we did the work 18 years ago. <laughs> so sometimes it takes more time than others. I wasn't the senior author, but the young woman who wrote that paper is now working at the Royal Tyrell Museum, so she got a job out of it. Oops, wrong way. But a nice little side project. We also find in the site layers of stromatolites. You know, the algae where it's just coating the sea floor. You know, here's this big level of this stuff that we get there. We collected some, you know, multimeter sized blocks of this. And we discovered that these were associated with mud cracks, that the algae was forming on the rims of mud cracks and growing up. These gray ones are Salt Lake today. This is right off the point of. Uh, you know, if you go uh, west of the causeway, you can walk around and see all these uh, microbiolites, stromatolites. This is across the lake where the railroad tracks come out the other side. And literally on this limestone ridge behind there and one behind me over there, there's carbonate growing on it. They're forming reef structures like we see in the Precambrian and Cambrian on Pennsylvania limestones. And this was happening in the Ice Age when uh, there weren't any scavengers, it's too salty, you know, and thing, these, these stromatolites were actually forming reefs on the side of Lake Bonneville. And it's pretty, I brought a Chinese crew out there and they went nuts when they started seeing this stuff. Because this is, this is bigger than Shark Tooth Bay. This is one of the biggest accumulations of living stromatolites on the planet. And no one pays attention to it. Fish from Lake Dixie, we got a lot of them. We've named some of them. Others we're working on still. We have lungfish, we have a giant coelacanth. We got definitely disarticulated skulls of the coelacanth. Uh, that's going to be named after the Johnson family. We have semionotids. 
Uh, Dr. Sarah Gibson, I wrote the best letter I've ever written anybody uh, to get her in the University of Kansas to work with Hans, uh, Peter Schultz, uh, and Gloria Radia uh, as their last PhD student. They are two of the top Mesozoic fish people in the world, and she was their last student. So she's currently the only serious Triassic Jurassic fish worker in North America that really knows her stuff. Uh, Lysotis, we may name this after Jeremy Roberts if we get this, the Utah Raptor State Park. Andrew's okay with that. We have paleoniscoids or seminodids. Some of the seminodids are two feet long. I mean, this is kind of a showing you like what the fish assemblies look like. <coughs> Giant coelacanths, big spiny sharks, Lysotis. The lungfish are big. You know, these are two meters long. This thing's probably getting to three or four meters long. Uh, Semi-noteds from little ones to ones that are over a meter long, and lots of paleoniscoids that are all probably a foot and under in length. And those are the things, if you're out fishing in Lake Dixie, these are what you'd be going for. And they're everywhere. There's a ton of material. Let's see. Uh, vertebrates, there's actually dinosaur bones on site. This is actually on the property of the school but they've set it aside so we can do encore, encore uh, excavations there. Quite a lot of dinosaur teeth. Uh, these big slender teeth, you know, are up to that long. So it's the Ubrani's tooth maker. There's a vertebra, uh, that vertebra's from one. And one thing is exciting, Adam Marsh is writing this up now. And I don't know if any of you know Adam, he works a lot with uh, uh, Randy, he's at Petrified Forest, did his PhD on uh, Dilophosaurus and Megapnosaurus, re-describing them. The Megapnosaurus paper should be out pretty soon, a very detailed description. So he's very familiar with these things. Um, so he's writing this stuff up. I mean, I had and uh, Don prep on that vertebra probably for four or five months, not 24-7, but uh, every time he says, this is this enough? Nah, we gotta do more. But what it is, it's not a Dilophosaurus vertebra. It's actually a more derived tetanurin vertebra. So it's actually closer to Allosaurus than it is to Dilophosaurus, uh, even though they both occur later. Now we'll talk a little bit about these teeth, but you see how many, these are all different big teeth. Some of the serrations, but a lot of these big slender teeth. And comparing these, you know, at Berkeley, looking at Dilophosaurus, one of the things we see with Dilophosaurus itself in the Kayenta, 10 million years later, <coughs> you know, it's got pretty much blade-like teeth, though the ones up the front are broken, so we don't have a good tooth to look at from the front of the mouth. But you see this big notch, like you see in spinosaurs and in crocodilians. You often have this notch, and you have this widened rostrum expansion. You see this in phytosaurs, you see in crocs, you see in a number of marine reptiles. It's an adaption to help catch fish. You know, having a long, narrow set of jaws is important, so when you clamp your jaws shut, you know, you're not pushing out water too much. You're always going to push up some, but then you got these big, long teeth that can grab onto it with the biggest group at the very front of your mouth uh, to grab them. One of the things we see, and we compare this to Spinosaurus teeth, so there's a Spinosaurus tooth there. Here's uh, one of the teeth from this site. There's another one there. You notice the wear right up the carina from the root all the way to the tip of the tooth on Spinosaurus. Uh, worn spinosaur teeth, and get a lot more money if they're not worn, and on these teeth. And that's from eating these seminodids. You know, we have schools, that's the most common fish in here, schools of these things. Spinosaurs are eating a type of seminodids called lipidotes, or, or sheetia, which are like two meter long, three meter long seminodids. And they have these ganoid scales like gars have today. So you have like tooth enamel on the scales, the big, thick, heavy scales. So these things are biting through a chain mail of these armored scales. And it's enamel on enamel wear. Remember, you can wear a diamond on a diamond. You know, same hardness will cut itself. So basically, these things are biting through chain mail of these fish and giving themselves a unique and very specialized kind of tooth wear, I think, is related. These guys are fishing. And we have published on that. And here's a piece of art we had done for that purpose to show these things going after the semi And you notice these guys don't have crests on their heads. 
<laughs> because they're 10 million years later is when we see crests. Uh, so they're not the same sort of thing. Uh, plants. We've got plant sites, and we showed you some plants in the lake system, but we also get them just underneath the track site, a very good plant site. Uh, I found some pretty good stuff. Andrew found an amazing site. In fact, uh, St. Georgia, Jensen and I, uh, is named for the guy that owned the property where the, the best plants were found. Milnerites is named for Andrew Milner. It's a type of conifer. But if you look at San Georgia, St. Georgia, Jensen and I, this thing is a branch of a conifer with the cones preserved on it. So you can describe the cones, the seeds, you know, uh, you know there's a seed. Oh, that's our Caraides stockii. These are fern leaves, horsetail stems. Pretty exciting, because everybody said there's no change on plants across the Triassic-Jurassic boundary. Every single plant we could ID was new. It wasn't a single Chinle taxa that we found in this plant site. So something's going on with plants too, which, oops, which we wouldn't have known, except we got a plant site. Uh, as digging goes across the street, you know, he's digging down in the Dinosaur Canyon member, well below the track level, which would have been way up there. And finding, you know, look at this trackway, coming down from Arlene, Arlene cleaning this big block up. So what do you do with that? You know, it turns out that block weighs 28,000 pounds. <laughs> this is almost double the size of the Utah Raptor block. It's a big hunk of rock, and that is solid sandstone. Uh, they found more over there, you know, and they're collecting them, you know, these blocks. Uh, but as they started working, you know, we're going on to this stuff, you know, we start going into the design phase of the museum, start getting funding so we can, say, we can build something on this site. Uh, so various, uh, pro, you know, uh, architects got brought on board. See, so they are surveying the thing. They want to keep the, the wall a certain distance from the road. Uh, you see where Andrew's standing down here. Um, basically, he's got something kind of important down there. They moved all the blocks down here. See, here's a shade structure they built way down there instead of behind us over on this side. Uh, so people could still you know, come and be entertained. But there's something down there right by the side of the road and we don't want to see it hurt. And what it is, is we got on the main trackway. Remember that trackway with the tail drags? There's a place where the dinosaur sat down on the sandbar to sun itself. And it sat down here. There's its foot with its metatarsals line. There's the ischial callosity, the butt print. You know, they have these bones that come down off the pelvis. This big, massive ischial bone comes down to rest on. So this thing's resting. And then here are the hand marks. And you see in Jurassic Park, bad. They show the hands like this. They can't do that. You break them. The hands will point in or up. Here's one that shows the hands resting on the ground, pointed in. You can see the hooks and the claws on these things in. There's the trackway going up. Thing gets up, takes a step, stumbles, and sits down again. There's another skill claw, there's the other track with the foot. And then finally, short step, longer step, and into the trackway. And as it goes up the hill, up the one of the big mounds, it leaves tail drags. Only leaves them when it's going uphill. When it's going downhill, there's no tail drags. Uphill goes <laughs> tail drags, so tilted back. Well, you know, we're doing great, but the city's like, well, we, you're going to have to collect that. We cannot fix it. So we brought in uh, Nefra Matthews of the BLM, did photogrammetry, collected all this data. And I got wind that Matt Lauer, or Today Show, was looking to do a dinosaur thing. I said, hey, you should see down St. George. We have a sitting dinosaur with butt mark preserved. <laughs> and when the Today Show got word, there's a butt mark in St. George, Utah, <laughs> stopped the presses, and the Today Show did a live remote with Teresa Walker. You know, so Teresa's down there, and Lester Holt was the one that did the interview with her, and if you ever get a chance to see that interview, which I'm not sure if they saved it, but I did watch it live, he asked her five or six times, where's the bet mark? Where's the bet mark? She's talking about the hands, she's talking about the feet, how it got up and stumbled. She never, in the whole interview, points out these are the Ischial closets, this is the butt mark. 
And literally, he did ask her five or six times, where's the butt mark? Where's the butt mark? This butt right here. Where's the butt mark? Never was shown. So the rest of the nation never saw the, the butt mark. But the city of St. George got a, uh, the city council to pass a waiver so we could put the building closer to the road than it was legally able to do normally. So he got a waiver, moved the building. So thanks to the Today Show, this was able to be saved. You know, so you got to call out your friends, politicians, news people, and be really subtle so you don't get fired in the process. Teresa literally ended up getting booted off the site for doing stuff like that. But her as a squeaky wheel was one of the most important things about the whole process because she didn't care. <laughs> They're not paying me. I'm going to do whatever I think is necessary. Well, more, you know, they brought in, you know, there's Darcy. You know, they drilled holes in this, made this concrete bed, and lowered the thing into a footing of concrete so you can go there and see this block. That's the biggest single track block on exhibit indoors anywhere. It's not in situ as it was found. This was brought in a couple football fields away where it was discovered. <coughs> and they lowered it in place. They put it in through the roof with one of the biggest cranes I'd ever seen on the back of a truck. All of that paid out of Darcy's pocket. Yeah, that was not paid by the people of Utah. That was Darcy just throwing checks out and, and having his engineers design how to do it. Uh, there's Andrew looking at it. Here's some of the maps. Uh, they refer to that block as poetry on, on rock because uh, it is an incredible thing. Say what? More great tracks. They found more blocks. Here they are working on the additional blocks. And Darcy got his engineers out, and they designed a two-tiered track level. You know, where they put the blocks in as they were mapped at an angle of about, I don't know, 70 degrees, so it's almost vertical, and laid them in, in the proper positions. And they literally moved them. And you see there's some cracks and stuff, but they did a great job. And since then, they filled in all the cracks, so it looks really, really nice. And that's the single biggest vertical track wall uh, that's been artificially put back together anywhere in the world as well. Uh, there are a lot of challenges still, you know, we get windy here, and uh, the little <laughs> shelter down at the other end while they were putting up the building uh, collapsed pretty uh, seriously one day, uh, you know, and that was bound to happen. Across the road, way up on this hill, they found another track site they refer to as the LDS track site because it's sitting right on the site of a, a future steakhouse. Uh, but the church traded with the city, so the city has this land as well. Uh, and they're going to put a three-story building over this hill so they can develop three different track levels in the building. Wow. Uh, they're, you know, they're trying to get five to ten million bucks for this new facility across the road. There's the building going up. There it goes. You know, right by the side of the road. And you can see how close it is to the, the pavement. And voila. Yeah. Open April 2005. There it is. Uh, uh, ribbon cutting. You know, they let Andrew cut it because you know without you know Andrew is you know the heart of this. Here's Laverna Johnson Sheldon. Laverna is the one that got the money. She went to Washington twice and testified before Congress. She was up here talking to our legislators. She didn't hesitate be on the phone. She was calling Fox News probably once a week, you know, because they were her people. You know? <laughs> and she went after this and after this and after this and got the job done. This is the Dinosaurium uh, Torium board, uh, the whole Dinosaurium, uh, that's something she came up with. Uh, I mean, she's really the heart of this thing. Uh, you know, Sheldon's a very, you know, soft-spoken guy, wonderful guy. But Laverna doesn't take no for an answer. You know, failure was not an option. She's supporting him. You know, she just stands in the background for Sheldon, but she's doing all the heavy lifting on this thing. Uh, the lab, they set aside a little corner of the place. Remember, the whole thing dips on that slope. So they used to be able to roll marbles if you had wheels on your chair. You could ride across the whole lab going downhill. <laughs> Uh, on the surface. So one of the first things they did was put in a level floor in the lab. That was pretty neat. They actually gave them walls at one point. 
you know, uh, because the city wasn't really wanting to see a research museum there. They, you know, wanted something for the public. They still, they want to put up a, you know, a, a skateboard park on the land across the street, which we're still fighting them on to put these other buildings. But we have this great crew of volunteers and really good work is going on in there. A lot of fossils, a lot of fossils you see up here, these phytosaur skulls and things. You know, a lot of that work is being done down there in that lab by UFOP volunteers in St. George. They've gotten uh, sculptures made of the main principal animals. Uh, Jerry got a Scolitosaurus skeleton, a cast of one, but this is the only one in North America. Scolitosaurus is the earliest uh, armored dinosaur known in the world, most complete dinosaur ever found in Great Britain, and we got a cast of in St. George. I work on armored dinosaurs. I mean, I, I bow before Jerry, because having this available, I, I mean, I held that real thing, you know, I've, you know, my laugh, and the, the British paleontologist is looking at me and laughing, and I was just, I was just drooling, uh, looking at this thing after it was found. But we got one in Utah, uh, which for my research is, is incredible. They uh, put in a boardwalk. Uh, you know, one of the things, you see the windows here? This is one of the things I really complained about from day one. We don't want windows in a museum. You want to control the light. You want low light to make the tracks, you know, stand out. And they wanted windows. They'll save money on lighting. You know, we want to save money. You know, that's what's most important here. So, and they put all this glass, and you couldn't see the tracks. So eventually, they covered the windows <laughs> and put in a boardwalk and lights underneath it, low lights, make the tracks pop, you know, and show up just beautifully. You know, they took one of the room, uh, the classroom, and it's now mainly being used for traveling exhibits. And they rotate exhibits out of there every few months. So there's always something fresh for people in town to see. Susan Grove put together under uh, Andrew's direction the second longest mural anywhere in Utah uh, that shows the whole panorama of this, this deposit as you would see it from standing, you know, on that boardwalk. Uh, it's really quite nice. Look over the years, just dirt out there. You know, when we first started, this is, you know, 2004, still mostly dirt, though the school was starting to come in there. The red star shows where the uh, uh, St. George site is. Uh, slowly it's developed, and there are more and more housing and shopping centers surrounding it now. You know, Warner Hill, the plant site, the best one was right there. It's gone. They, they have a shopping center there. They just leveled the whole site. We salvaged a lot of good fossils out of there. Uh, uh, collateral research, the UGS and the, B, uh, and the BLM have worked together uh, for inventories of various national parks. As Jeff Marks has been working with us at Zion and Arches on this stuff. Andrew's been working with us on these Chin Lee sites, uh, the Chin Lee draining. Uh, uh, Aunt Randy, you know, we started, you know, because of the fish, wanting to go out because this is where the American Museum got all the Triassic fish, was this ridge right here, figured out, oh, it's state land. I'll write us a permit. Let's go check it out. And the U's been working in this area ever since, collected tons of fish. Uh, these sites are at the high part of the Ch Triassic toward the extinction. And in the St. George area, it's much, much older. You know, that giant phytosaur skull that's in, uh, sitting on a shelf at the museum is much older than those uh, skulls uh, you know, that are from the, the more recent excavations that Randy and Andrew have been leading. That was the lower one was found by Don DeBlue, of course. Uh, but from this, we've worked out this really nice depositional pattern for the Chin Lee in Utah. None of this was known before. They all thought it was all flatbedded parallel with everything else. Very rarely are any of our formations like that. Uh, fish from down there, because I said we went there to fish. You know, Walt, you uh, UFOP member from here, found Walt's fish quarry. It's one of the best <laughs> Triassic fish quarries anywhere. Uh, as many as 10 taxa from that one site. Uh, this is some of the material that's been prepped from there. Uh, there's tons more to do. Uh, well, if you notice, Chin Leah was named from that site. There's a new Tanny Croceus that's going to be described from there. The best one ever found, new red fielded. It's lots of new fish. Uh, very exciting stuff. 
Uh, we found a fish site just up the road here, Diamond Fork. You know, as you go across over above Spanish Fork, uh, rock sod out the a chunk of rock. This is the top of the Triassic going up that hill, and it's full of fishes. I think there's six fish in it we know of already in a chunk of rock this big. So hopefully we'll do more with that as well. But that's you know 45 minutes from right here. Uh, Selena Suarez working on the Triassic Jurassic extinction boundary. Camp is the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province. At the end of the Triassic, there was huge flood basalts that came out to the whole Atlantic region and made a major signal in the geochemistry of the world's atmospheres at the time. It's tied into the mass extinction that permitted dinosaurs to take over. We are lining it up. This is uh, Black Canyon right at the entrance of Zion. And we are lining it out there and tying it into the tracks, tying it into the stratigraphy relative to the track site and what you see at Zion National Park. And that's some real exciting. She's got a half a million dollar grant for this. Uh, she's also working in uh, South Africa on correlative rocks tied to that project. And of course, with Ron Blakey, we've established a lot. We named Lake Dixie. Lake Dixie wasn't on anybody's maps until we pushed it with Ron. Ron was old professor of mine, so I was able to convince him to add it into his <laughs> maps of the Southwest. Uh, but his, his whole model, the Okubanga Interior Delta, works beautiful for like Dinosaur Canyon and a lot of the Chinle, but the lower, I mean, uh, the lower uh, upper Kayanta. But if we look at the Moanavi, Whitmore Point Lake, it was wetter. This thing filled with water. So instead of a, de a delta that just kind of fizzes out into the desert, like what we see in Botswana today, we had a big lake, close to the size of Lake Erie at times. And we also see that in early Jurassic, and we're exploring that. And Warner Valley, looking at it, we've got sites that produce cycads, uh, armored dinosaur teeth. We don't have a skeletal skeleton yet, but give us time. Paul Olson is bringing in the uh, deep continental coring program, and we're going to drill a six-inch research core from the top of Sand Mountain all the way down through the Moenkopi, through the entire Lower Jurassic and uh, Triassic. And uh, this will be a core to look at paleoenvironmental data. It'll be six inches, done at 45 degree angles, so we can orientate everything in it. It'll cost a million dollars to drill uh, at a minimum. Uh, but the grant is probably going to happen. They just finished drilling the one at Petrified Forest. Where is this, Jim? This Sand Mountain, that's the north side of Warner Valley. Okay. Yeah, we're probably going to be more on you know, back slope, but so we can get through all yeah. those rocks. But just collateral, you know, things. So you go up in the sand dunes. You know, we're going, getting ready to do a big project. I'm writing a grant right now. Work with Adam Marsh from Petrified Forest and Randy to start looking at the Kayenta Formation uh, more seriously in the Moab region to see if salt tectonics is giving us special conditions in the early Jurassic. That'll give us bones. We did find a big theropod at Arches. I've got high hopes we're going to get more bone beds uh, in some of these areas that I have scouted out, and we're hoping to spend a few weeks working. Uh, and Adam's going to come up. Andrew's going to come up. We're hopefully have a big crew uh, to start looking for stuff in the early Jurassic there. Uh, you know, Washington County, before the site was discovered, 200 known sites. In the last 20 years since then, now there are 500 uh, sites that were discovered afterwards, total 700 sites. So there's been a lot of collateral damage in terms of discoveries in the region because of the discovery of the St. George Dinosaur Site. Uh, conferences, six conferences directly tied to it. The uh, Grand Staircase Conference just happened to use St. George, I don't count it. Some people say we have seven. We've had four Utah Friends of Paleo meetings there. Uh, and there have been three field trips from national conferences that were elsewhere, like the SVP meeting here, that had field trips where this area was a major part of it. This is all because of the track site discovery. Conferences bring money to these communities. You know, let's help out our local communities with these incredible re paleo resources. Uh, 27 scientific publications have been published. It was 26 when I started putting the talk together, but then the Fish stick paper came out, so it became 27. <laughs> there are four in review right now. And Andrew's working on three other ones right now that he hopes to get submitted in the next couple of weeks. Uh, there are 23 conference abstracts, you know, for talks or posters 
that was sub submitted. Several poems have been written about the site by Laverna Johnson, who wrote the uh, Dinosaurs and Dixie uh, song for the opening that their choir sang. Uh, so she, there's been music written about the site. Uh, and of course the book Tracks of Deep Time, which we have over here. So basically St. George, this is a great American success story. You know, we didn't get the money this year for the Utah Raptor State Park, but my hope is once we have a catalyst like that north of Moab, we can have similar things for down there as well. But this was a catalyst for an amazing amount of good stuff for our state. And anybody that doesn't think this money was well spent is out of their minds. Anyway, thank you very much.